Britain is a small country, but she has over four and a half thousand miles of coastline, every mile of it open to attack from the sea. Henry VIII built forts up and down the coast like this one at Deal. Dover Castle dates back to Roman times, although it's been enlarged and altered down the centuries. Hundreds of Martello towers were built around 1812 to give warning of Napoleon's expected invasion. But one enemy has always remained the same, the sea itself. At Seaford in Sussex, householders on the front put up screens to stop flying shingle breaking the windows and build barricades of sandbags to keep the water out of their cellars. At the beginning of the century, Seaford was protected by a wide shingle beach, but the shingle has been carried away up the coast by the sea, and it's been necessary to build a deeper and ever deeper seawall. Since the war, about one and a half million pounds has been spent protecting this short piece of front, and still the work goes on. This shingle can be shoveled back onto the beach, but thousands of tons are lost by being carried away around Beachy Head towards Eastbourne. At Selsey, the lifeboat used to be on the beach, but it finished up at the end of this footbridge, 800 feet out to sea. So at last they had to build a new lifeboat house. But something drastic had to be done about the erosion at Selseyville. Up to 70 feet a year was being lost to the sea. So, a new seawall has been built and many houses have been saved, like this school. But the cost of sea defences is enormous. Who is to pay? The government and local authorities pay a large proportion. But the householders who benefit must contribute. This is hard sometimes, but if the work weren't done, these bungalows, for example, would soon be in the sea. If only beaches would stay put, but they are constantly on the move. At Rye, they use a very effective method of keeping their beach where it's wanted. They pick up the shingle from the end of the beach where it's drifted, load it into lorries, cart it back to where it started from, and dump it. The sea soon gets to work on this great pile of shingle and starts moving it back along the beach. Then the lorries will pick it up and bring it back again, and so on and so on forever. This may seem a discouraging job, but sometimes it's cheaper and more effective than any other method. Of course, Beaches sometimes grow instead of shrinking. The boathouse for the Walmer lifeboat is now so far from the sea, they've had to build a new steeper ramp to launch the boat. Walmer Castle used to have a sea-filled moat around it, but now it's on very dry land. Robin Hood's Bay near Whitby in Yorkshire is famous as a beauty spot and a haunt for painters. But the cliffs are crumbling and it seems that nothing can be done to save these houses. The stones and bricks on the beach below were once homes and soon those that are still standing will join them on the sand. It's said that over the coastline as a whole we are gaining as much land from the sea as we are losing to it. But that isn't much comfort if you live in Robin Hood's Bay. Most of the land we are winning from the sea is around the wash in East Anglia. Behind the new sea bank, the reclaimed land must be drained and cleaned of salt. It takes about five years before crops can be grown. 1,400 acres were reclaimed near here in 1948 and are now growing good crops. But low-lying land is always in danger from flooding. Long stretches of the east coast are below sea level. At Sea Pauling in the winter of 1953, the sea broke through the sand dunes just behind the lifeboat tavern and washed it away. Exactly what happened that January night is still a vivid memory to the locals. All along the east coast, the sea broke through sand dunes and shingle ridges, embankments and sea walls. It breached our sea defences in 1,200 places. 160,000 acres of land were flooded. 32,000 people lost their homes, 307 were drowned. The damage? Over 30 million pounds. Could such a disaster happen again? In addition to much government research, scientists at Oxford are using a tidal model of our coastline on the North Sea Basin to try to find the answer. What happened in 1953 
was a great wave of water, nine feet high, came surging in on top of the high tide. Higher surges have been known, and much higher tides, but not at the same time. The question is, could the highest possible surge occur on top of the highest spring tides? If this ever happened, the water level would be several feet higher than in 1953. Even if it is possible, it's extremely unlikely. But if it should happen, at least we shall be prepared. Since the 1953 floods, a warning system has been introduced. Up and down the coast from Aberdeen to Harwich, tide gauges are read every day and the height of the tide is reported to the flood warning organisation at Dunstable. The officer on duty at Dunstable receives these messages and his first task is to compare the predicted height of the tide with that actually reported. The difference between the two is the height of the surge. Now he's able to estimate the height the water will reach at various points along the coast. He asks the senior forecaster for the latest weather information. He now decides if a flood warning is necessary. A flood warning message is drafted and sent out over the teleprinter to those areas in danger, in this case, the Kent coast. Meanwhile, conditions are developing as expected. Northerly winds cause a long wave of water to travel down the North Sea. This is known as a surge. When this arrives near the time of very high tides, the height of the sea level is increased by the height of the surge, and floods occur. The headquarters of the Kent River Board receives its flood alert from Dunstable. It is now up to them to decide which areas will be affected and to advise the police. The flood alert has also come through to the county police headquarters at Maidstone. The river board now telephones the police to confirm the flood alert and to advise them which areas are in danger. It is up to the police to decide what action needs to be taken. They pass instructions to their stations in the danger areas. Patrol cars set out immediately to pass on the warning to the public. The local Bobby too sets out to warn the many isolated farms. He must be glad that for once it isn't the middle of the night. Precautions should now be taken to prevent damage to your property. Please warn your neighbours. The sea doesn't always come battering through sea walls. It creeps up estuaries and creeks, breaches the banks silently and suddenly it's there all around you. Furniture and food must be moved upstairs for safety. Animals must be rounded up and taken to higher ground. Some animals are old hands at the game. Others have to be persuaded every time. The sea that surrounds us is constantly attacking our defences. And even when it appears to sleep, it is just resting, ready to strike. But, say the experts, it won't catch us napping again. 